It's 6 a.m., the start of another work day. Angie, exhausted, drags herself out of bed and into the shower. At her church's community group uh, gathering uh, last night uh, after the, the meeting, one of the uh, uh, people asked her opinion. It turned into a 45-minute counseling session. So she was exhausted. After making lunches for uh, 12-year-old uh, uh, Mandy and 10-year-old Scott and uh, 7-year-old Christy, she wakes them up for school and as always they say, oh, I'm too tired to get up and after about 12 reminders, she finally gets them to make their beds and, and eat breakfast and brush their teeth and out the door to the bus. She only has a few minutes before she needs to leave for work. And uh, she, uh, as she jumps in her car, she makes a mental note. She needs to pick up treats for uh, Christy's soccer game tomorrow morning and for Scott's basketball game tomorrow afternoon. And she has to pick up her husband at 5.15 at the airport coming back from an out-of-town work trip. About 10 minutes into her rush hour commute, she remembers that the presentation she stayed up late preparing uh, is still laying on her desk. She'd made copies for everyone with design ideas and bar graphs and pie charts, and so she whirls the car around and, 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 and picks them up. She whisks into work about 30 minutes late to her boss, pacing back and forth. Uh, saying, your report was due 30 minutes ago, and the client is unimpressed. She tries to explain uh, her tardiness, but she can tell she's, uh, uh, it's on deaf ears, and she crumples into her chair with a headache throbbing, and her neck tight, and her stomach churning, and she fumbles in her purse for some uh, Tylenol. Angie's stress relaxation mirrors that of thousands of Americans as we keep tight schedules, tight plane connections, and, and pressures going all week long. It's, uh, stress is uh, taking a toll on our, our nation's health. Uh, two-thirds, uh, according to the American uh, uh, Association of Family Doctors, two-thirds of visits to family doctors are symptoms related to stress. 57% of people say they feel moderate uh, stress all the time. And 41% say that uh, stress has uh, adversely affected their health in the last 12 months. Hans Selye, who's the doctor who pioneered studies on stress, uh, says it's uh, not the one-time event of stress uh, that causes such havoc on the body. It's the long-term chronic Stress that goes on day after day, week after week, that causes uh, chemical changes in the body, that causes headaches and stomach problems and, and skin disorders and arterial sclerosis and all the different stress uh, symptoms. He says it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's when it's ongoing that it has the worst effect on the body. And of course, uh, uh, stress doesn't just have an effect on the body. Uh, the most uh, hardest blows may be on our emotional health and our relationships. Uh, when we work day after day with high levels of stress, we become such emotional wrecks that we're liable to fly off the handle at whoever comes in our way. Family members and friends kind of walk on eggshells around us hoping we won't blow up at them. Stress overload is exasperated by the fact that many people don't get enough sleep. Doctors say we need on average eight to nine hours a night, but many people only get six to seven hours a night. So we have many people who are sleep deprived. Stress overload is further exasperated by the fact that uh, the Harris uh, survey shows that there's a, a, a decline in leisure time. As many people are, are saying they don't have time for uh, relaxing activities and uh, they uh, constantly feel rushed. So what's the solution? How can we be dedicated workers, good students, and use our spiritual gifts to serve other people in the church and maintain our sanity and avoid burnout? The creation account tells us that God anticipated this problem from the beginning of creation. I think this sermon is going to change the lives of many of you today. 
chapter 2 of Genesis, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Does this mean that after six days of creation, God was exhausted, needed a break? No, Isaiah says God never grows tired or weary. Uh, He rested not because he needed a reprieve, but to show us an example of how we work best. He was introducing to us a maintenance plan for the entire human race. He wanted to announce to all creation that after six days of labor, enough is enough. A day of rest is needed. Now, many people have never been taught this Sabbath solution. Or you may have learned about it, but you've overlooked it. You may be discouraged or on the verge of a breakdown because you're not practicing this Sabbath solution. Life is best lived when we practice a rhythm between work and rest. For many people, Sunday is hardly any different from any other day of the week. Having to work the weekend was unusual a few uh, decades ago, but now it's normal for a growing number of workers. Weekend shift work is now not just normal for emergency and healthcare workers. Uh, stores used to be closed on Sundays uh, several decades ago. Now retail workers, factory workers, many white-collar workers work weekends. We've become a 24-7 culture. The idea of a common pause day, let alone a Sabbath, is a distant memory. Although Sunday morning is still arguably the best time to gather a crowd, Sunday mornings do not provide the universal opportunity they used to. Yet still, God introduces His plan for all of us, that we need to set aside one day in seven for rest. Let's look at the principle. It's the fourth commandment in our series of the original top 10. It's Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 8. Why don't you read this with me? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor any foreigners residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but He rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Notice uh, the Sabbath day is made for foreigners. Uh, This sets apart the Ten Commandments from all other ancient codes. It signals that the Ten Commandments are for all people in this world. Now remember, we don't keep the commandments to earn God's favor. Uh, God's favor, salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We keep this commandment because God in His grace tells us this is how we function best. So what's the meaning of this commandment? Why does God give us the fourth command? The command teaches us something very important about how God made us. The Sabbath meets two important needs in our lives. First, the Sabbath meets our need for rest. The fourth commandment tells us that we're people who need to rest. It interprets our lives in terms of work and rest. How do you keep from having a mental breakdown? How do you avoid burnout? You see your life in terms of seven days. You know what's wrong with many people? They don't see their lives in terms of seven days. Some people see their lives in terms of one day. You can't balance one day. Something can go wrong. You can have a crisis. Other people go to the other extreme. They say, when I finish my residency, when I finish this project, when I get my broker's license, when I finish my graduate degree, then I'll calm down and relax. Then I'll have the the makeup time with family and friends that I'd have no time for right now. Uh, we'll, we'll make it up when we have the <clears throat> two-week two, two holiday we're going to have together. Or, I'm really crazy, wild right now, but uh, we'll make it up over Christmas vacation, 
That's when I'll spend time with family and friends that I, I don't have time to do right now. That won't work. A lot of people put so much hopes in the holidays for relaxation and rest and make-up time with friends and family that they burn out on the way to the holiday. Uh, they get there and uh, they're saying, hey, well, well, we've got this one weekend in Hawaii and uh, that's when we'll get, every, get everything back in balance. And they're too sick and tired to enjoy the break. God's solution is for us to see our lives in terms of seven days. You can manage seven days. Keep seven days balanced between work and play, between uh, mental time and physical time, between time to give and time to be renewed, and you'll stay sane. If you have a bad day and you know there's one day coming when you can get everything back in balance, you'll avoid burnout. But if you look ahead and all you see is a jumble of days that are all filled with pressure and headaches and deadlines and, they, and the days go on and on, that's when you burn out. God's model is to see your life in terms of seven days. Do all the things you need to do in seven days. Work, rest, exercise, family, friendships, ministry. The fourth commandment tells this, in order to function optimally over the long haul to maintain physical and emotional health, we have to set one day in seven aside to get our minds and body back in shape. We're creatures who need to rest. That's who we are and that's how we function best, in this rhythm. God told us centuries ago what only recently work analysts have concluded that Carefully used work breaks increase productivity. Statistics show that after approximately 40 hours of, week of work, concentration levels drop, mistakes increase, and morale takes a nosedive. Doctors tell us that seven day a week workers are the ones who lead the charts in stress related uh, health issues like high blood pressure and premature heart attacks. God tells us if we don't take a break, we'll just break. If we don't take a Sabbath voluntarily, we'll take it involuntarily. I'm talking about depression, ulcers, heart attacks, hospitalization. At some point, every one of us runs out of energy. It's like plugging in your cell phone. Your battery winds down, you have to recharge it. Jesus knew about our need for rest. On one occasion, when the disciples had returned from a, a week of, of uh, teaching and healing uh, ministry, He said, let's get away alone where we can rest. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to Him all they had done. Then, because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have a chance to eat, He said to them, come with Me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. In this commandment, God tells us not to forsake the rhythm between work and rest. Now it's your responsibility to find your rest. There's no room for self-pity. Some people lament, I'm so busy, I don't have time to, for play or relaxation or for hobbies. They want you to feel sorry for them. That won't work. You can't, uh, if you're not staying in balance between rest and work, you can't blame somebody else. That's your responsibility. You have to find your rest. Now, before I talk about the second need that the Sabbath provides, let me make a side comment. Some of you are, are, are saying, oh, I love this sermon about sleep and having fun. I'm all over this. I mean, you're up at the crack of lunch. And you work just part-time, and you're not hard-working. Uh, you don't need to work less. You need to work more. You're wondering, work six days a week? Work hard? What if I experience burnout? I mean, you're about as close to burnout as I am to getting pregnant. <laughs> you need to focus on the six days you shall labor part of this commandment. Now, there's a second need this commandment meets. The Sabbath meets our need for worship. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths. 
This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Uh, God tells us the Sabbath is not just a day for leisure, it's also for worship. It's a covenant between us and God. Uh, In Deuteronomy, Moses expands on this commandment that we find in Exodus 20. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Now, the Sabbath day, which was on Saturday in Old Testament, became Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, God tells us we're not just called to rest, we're called to worship. The writers to the Hebrews tells us, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. He tells us we're not to give up meeting together uh, for worship. Many people consider, are, consider themselves uh, followers of Christ, but they, they don't come to church. One of the reasons we're called to come and meet together is to encourage each other. You know, it's easy to, uh, to, to wake up on Sunday and say, you know, I don't need to go today. Nobody's going to miss me. I'll just read my Bible a little. Maybe I'll watch a Christian show on on TV. We forget that one of the reasons God commands us to meet together and worship is so that we can encourage others. And you can only encourage others by being there, being here. We come not just to receive for ourselves, but to give to others. God knows that we need to get out of the office, the bank, the hospital, the school, the home, wherever we perform our labor. After a week of being in our politically correct culture, where it's considered inappropriate to talk about Jesus, except for maybe a swear word, but it's perfectly acceptable to bash Christians, we need a new environment where we can rub shoulders with fellow believers. We gather together to get a spiritual meal. He knows that in the workplace we face a steady stream of pressures. We have to drive. We have to push ourselves. We sometimes get up beat up and emotionally. After a week like that, even the strongest Christians need another spiritual meal. We need to reconvene and replenish the food supply, refocus spiritually. God knows that if we work seven days a week, week after week, we'll begin to lose perspective on the true meaning of life. Will wear out physically, burn out emotionally, and fall out of touch with spiritual realities. We'll get caught in a downward spiral that weakens our marriages, families, friendships, health, and even our moral uh, convictions. God instituted Sabbath, congregational worship, to save His people from extinction. He knows that human nature is weak. Without the practice of coming together, we're prone to fall away from our faith. So what can you and I do to balance our lives and put this Sabbath principle into practice? Let me give you four practical suggestions. First, prepare ahead of time. If you're going to make Sunday a meaningful day of rest and worship, you have to plan for it, prepare for it. If you find you miss worship on some Sundays because you get up too late, or the family's trying to get ready and get here on time and you're at each other's throats, then make some strategy changes so that doesn't happen. Uh, A pastor called one of his uh, members to ask why he wasn't in church. And he said, well, I'd rather be in bed thinking about church than in church thinking about bed. At least my mind's in the right place. Second, make Sunday a change of pace. Slow down. A little bit on Sunday. After worship, set aside some time to relax, read a book, take a nap. If you're cooped up in the office all week, take some time for exercise and recreation. Play games, share with good friends and family. Do some things you don't have time to do the rest of the week. Don't allow your family to move in all different directions on Sunday. Do things together so it becomes a family day. Invite some friends over. Whatever you do, don't schedule it so tightly that it becomes like every other day of the week. 
Try to make it a work-free day. Put down your cell phone. Shut down the computer. Get your work done on the other six days. Third, put a priority on being in worship each Sunday. Now, I realize you're here. You're probably not the ones that need to hear this message. It's probably the ones that aren't here. When God tells us to remember the Sabbath, not give up meeting on the Lord's Day, it's because He knows that you and I need to meet together to find the strength and encouragement to make it through the week. He knows we can't make it alone. Now, Sundays is no longer sacred in our country. Youth sports programs schedule uh, games and tournaments on Sundays all the time. Maybe if you're parenting a youth, you need to draw a line in the sand and say, you know, if, if this activity is going to keep our son or daughter from coming to worship with us, uh, from uh, being part of the youth group or attending summer camp, maybe we're just going to say we're not going to do that. Maybe they can be involved in the activity, but if it comes to Sunday morning, we're going to say no. We talked last week about many young adults are, are drifting away from the church after they graduate from high school. It's sure not going to help if in their growing up years they never learned the practice of attending church. Then finally, do not judge others for their observance of the Sabbath. Now I'm suggesting this morning that many of us overlook the importance of this fourth commandment and that we need to take some steps to make Sunday different from the other days of the week. But I don't want you to become legalistic about how you observe it and legislate uh, the actions of others. The Apostle Paul writes, You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Some people work in professions where it's difficult to avoid working on Sundays. Like many pastors, they're going to have to find another day of the week to find renewal. It might help to think of uh, uh, the seven days of the week as 21 eight-hour blocks. Uh, seven are for sleep. Maybe ten are for work, for your work work and other kinds of work you have to do to keep your home running. And maybe you schedule four for rest and renewal. And who's to decide what's the source of rest and renewal for another person? Whereas yard work may be more duty than delight for uh, you, maybe for somebody else it's one of the finest forms of relaxation. Uh, Sabbath observance was one of the sticking points between Jesus and the religious establishment. Uh, Mark tells us in chapters 2 and 3 of his gospel that the Pharisees were irate that Jesus and his disciples picked grain and that Jesus healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. They had all these elaborate rules for what you can do on the Sabbath. I mean, they had debates about weird stuff like if your grandmother is out walking in the field and she slips and falls, so granny goes down. Granny's laying on the floor or laying on the ground. And they would have debates about, you know, is it okay to, to pick up granny and walk her back to the house? I mean, you know, they'd say, well, is, 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 is granny going to die? If, she, if she's going to die, maybe God's okay with us picking her up and, and carrying her back to the house. But if she's not going to die, maybe we just leave her there until the Sabbath is over. I mean, you've got to be crazy to be having these kind of discussions. You know, they're saying, well, I don't know. Do we help Granny up? Do we leave her? I mean, Granny, are you, are you okay? Are you, is your hip broken? Are you, are you bleeding out? I mean, you've got to be nuts to be asking these kind of questions. Jesus said to the Pharisees, I'm not bound by those rules. For I am the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is for me. He's telling us that in our attempts to fulfill this fourth commandment, we're not supposed to get too locked in. Don't swamp it with rules. We're to enjoy it as a precious gift from God. As long as we use the day to get our minds and bodies back in shape and our uh, motive is to honor Christ and, and worship Him, we're free to use the day as we deem best. Life is best lived when we practice a rhythm between work and rest. 
And I suggest we put a priority on Sunday worship and make Sunday a change of pace. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this commandment. Of the Ten Commandments, I'm guessing this is the one that's been most forgotten. Kind of like, well, that one doesn't count anymore. But you tell us that we are creatures who need rest. We need to balance our seven days of the week. They can't all look alike or we'll burn out. And so, Lord, help us to rethink how we do this seven days of work and rest and maybe rethink how we use Sundays if we're able to, to make it a day that's a real change of pace and worship is a priority. I want to give you a moment, I always do, to pray to God. Maybe you've been convicted today. Maybe this message has hit you right between the eyes and you say, you know, I need to make some changes. Why don't you tell Him what you're thinking and changes you'd like to make and ask Him to help you do that. I'll give you a moment to pray. Lord God, thank You for all of these commandments. They're not a way to earn our way into heaven. They are a statement of Your grace to us of how we work best, how we function best. And so help us to learn from this commandment that to, 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 to make sure we have a balance of work and rest. And we put a priority on uh, worshiping You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.